Shalom, shalom, and welcome to Treasured Inheritance Ministry. I'm Yosef Ben Avram, and I'm glad that you have joined me for part two of the gatekeepers, the protectors of his presence. And I've entitled part two, Zadok and the Final Remnant. Now, brothers and sisters, if you haven't had or you haven't had the opportunity to listen to the covenant teachings, then I would like to ask you that you take the time and consider listening to the four part teaching on the covenants. The reason for this is if you listen to covenants and then Elijah, the man in the message, and then Ezekiel, the four part teaching on Ezekiel, then these teachings, they will make so much more sense to you. Everything on this channel follows a theme and we are trying to build on a foundation so that we can have a deeper understanding of what Yahweh is saying to his body at this time. So if you are new to this channel, then I would like to urge you to listen to those teachings in the order that was given and then I believe that you will have a deeper and more clearer understanding of this message, the gatekeepers, and everything will fit together for you perfectly. So without further ado, let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you today in the wonderful and powerful name of Yeshua. Father, I want to pray today that as we get into your word, Father, that there will be understanding in the hearts and lives of your people. I pray, Father, that we will take stock of our own lives and, Father, that we will be the gatekeepers that we need to be for our own lives first so that when we go out there into the world, Father, that we can truly make a lasting difference for your kingdom. I pray today, Father, that everything that is discussed here will not just be words, but, Father, that it will bring transformation to our lives and cause us to live righteously for you and for your glory. I pray, Father, that everybody will have eyes to see and ears to hear. And, Father, that they will become sons and daughters of righteousness in this generation. We thank you for this time, Father, and the honor and the privilege that we have to share together. In Yeshua Mashiach's name we pray. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, I'd like to just shortly touch on the highlights of part one. In part one, we spoke about the role of a gatekeeper and we came to see that their duty was not just being stationed at gates, but that they were also the musicians in the tabernacle, that they took care of the utensils as well as the ark, and that they would move the ark from place to place upon their shoulders. This was their duty. We also spoke about who were the gatekeepers, and we came to see that contrary to what many people have been taught, that the sons of Korah were not killed during Korah's rebellion when he tried to usurp the priesthood and the authority from Moses and Aaron. The Bible tells us that the sons of Korah were spared. They did not die. The reasons for this, we can only speculate, but I believe that Yahweh had a plan, and we see how this plan has unfolded throughout time, how they have been stationed as gatekeepers, as the ones tending to the things in Yahweh's tabernacle. We also spoke about Pinchas, the warrior priest, the guy that took his spear and drove it through his countrymen as well as the Midianite woman, so that Yahweh's presence might return. And it was given to him as an everlasting covenant that he and his family members would serve before Yahweh. And we see that in the story of the gatekeepers that it was Pinchas, the son of Eliezer, who was the son of Aaron, who is the one that is the overseer over the gatekeepers. He becomes the first gatekeeper of Yahweh. We then spoke about obed Edom, the man who was blessed by Yahweh to have eight sons who had sons. Those eight sons had sons and all almost 60 to 62 of them were worshipping before Yahweh in a capacity as a gatekeeper. We also saw that obed Edom, his life was blessed. He's the guy that had the ark in his house after David's first failed attempt at bringing the ark of Yahweh back to Jerusalem. Because of the, the, the threshing floor and because Uzziah struck the ark, he died. And David was upset and he left the ark at Obed-Edom's house. And we see how the life of Obed-Edom was blessed because Yahweh was there. And he worships Yahweh. And, and we see how him and his children desire to be in Yahweh's presence. We then spoke about Zadok briefly. And we saw that Zadok was a, a descendant of Pinchas who was a descendant of Eliezer who was a descendant of Aaron, the high priest. And we see that they are actually family members of one another. Nine generations later, we have Zadok from Pinchas. And both of these men stand up for Yahweh's righteousness. The righteousness runs so deep in their veins. Now, brothers and sisters, we will take a look at the prophetic story of Zadok as a gatekeeper and protector of Yahweh's presence as well as the prophetic picture of his two sons. And we will also discuss the role of a gatekeeper 
today. Now, brothers and sisters, we see the same thing happening in the book of Samuel. You see, all these men have been chosen by Yahweh to restore things. Samuel, Pinchas, John, Elijah, Deborah, even Rav Shul, and Yeshua himself. You see, they have all been called to restore Yahweh's presence among the house of Israel. And how do they do this? By removing the wicked leaders and the wickedness that are among the people and beginning to teach the people the right way according to the covenant that was given to them at the mountain. Now, Eli was the priest who did not purge out the profane and instead he allows his sons to do evil in the tabernacle. And because of this wickedness, he and his sons were judged for it. And this is the recurring theme of the work of the Elijah and Elisha Remnant. Their work and their duty is purging the people of their profanity and preparing them to be a holy people. Why? So that eventually everyone might stand in Yahweh's presence before Him. Brothers and sisters, the principal mission of the Elijah remnant is to confront the profane leaders and present the people with the correct way, the right way of holy living. And in this case, Samuel was brought into the tabernacle to replace the profane Eli and his sons. Let's see what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 1 onwards. It says, Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim, Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim. His name was Elkanah, son of Jerome, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zufa, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah was childless. Take note of this. Both Hannah and John's mother, Elizabeth, are barrenless. They are not able to conceive children until Yahweh opens their womb. Very, very significant. Now this man used to go up from his town every year to worship and to sacrifice to Yahweh Sabaoth in Shiloh. The two sons of Eli, Hophni and Pinchas, not the same Pinchas, a different Pinchas, right? Same name, different guy. The sons of Eli, Hophni and Pinchas were Kohenim, priests of Yahweh there. Then on the designated day, Elkanah would sacrifice and give portions to his wife, Penina, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would only give one portion, even though he loved Hannah, for Yahweh had closed her womb. Do you see that? Her rival would taunt her bitterly to provoke her, because Yahweh had closed her womb. So it was year after year. Whenever she went up to the house of Yahweh, that she would provoke her, so she wept and would not eat. Brothers and sisters, Samuel is a type of Elijah. He's a type of John in the fact that he too was preparing the way for the Messiah. The Messiah here in this picture, remember, is King David. It's a type and foreshadow of Messiah Yeshua. David is a type and foreshadow of the Messiah. And take note of the story of Saul found in 1 Samuel chapter 15, when he did not obey Yahweh regarding the Amalekite. You see, in this story, Samuel functions as a type of warrior priest, just like Pinchas. They were both, in my opinion, warrior priests. You see, Samuel goes out and he kills the evil king whom Saul disobediently kept alive. Samuel's duty is the same as the end time Elijah and John. His role is to make sure that Israel remains faithful to Yahweh. And he is also responsible to prepare the way for the coming king. You see, brothers and sisters, we need to see the connections here. Because of the sin of Baal Peor that we spoke about in the days of Pinchas, Yahweh's presence, his presence departed from their midst. And we see this again in the story of Samuel and the capturing of the ark of Yahweh. Yahweh allowed his ark to be taken. Take note of that. It didn't, it's not just that, oh, okay, now I got taken and, and, and why? No, Yahweh allows his ark to be taken by the Philistines. Why? Due to the sins of Israel. Yahweh departs from us, people, because of our own sins. The same thing is happening here. Let's have a look at what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 1 to 22. So it was that the word of Samuel went forth to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines in battle. They camped at Ebenezer while the Philistines camped in Aphek. The Philistines drew up in battle array to meet Israel. And when the battle was fought, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed 4,000 men on the battlefield. When the people came back to the camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why did Yahweh bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? 
Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of Yahweh from Shiloh, that he may come among us and deliver us from the hand of our enemies. So the people went to Shiloh, and from there they carried the ark of the covenant of Yahweh Savaot, who sits above the cherubim. Eli's two sons, Hophni and Pinchas, were there with the ark of the covenant of Elohim. Now when the ark of the covenant of Yahweh entered the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so the ground resounded. When the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they wondered, What's this noise of a great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? When they realized that the ark of Yahweh had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid, for they said, Yahweh is coming to the camp. So they said, Woe to us, for nothing like this has ever happened before. Woe to us. Who will deliver us from the hand of the mighty Elohim? This is the Elohim that struck down the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Be strong and conduct yourselves like men, O Philistines, or else you will become enslaved to the Hebrews and they have, as they have been to you. Be like men and fight. So the Philistines did fight and Israel was defeated. They fled every man to his tent. The slaughter was very great. As 30,000 of Israel's foot soldiers fell. Moreover, the ark of Yahweh was captured, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Pinchas, died. Now that same day, a man in, of Benjamin ran from the battlefield and came to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dust on his head. When he arrived, behold, Eli was sitting on his seat by the wayside, watching for his heart was trembling for the ark of Yahweh. When the man arrived to announce it in the town, the entire town cried out, Do you see that Eli is sitting at the gates as a judge? He is sitting at the place where the entire city would hear the news. And it says the following in verse 14. And when Eli heard the noise of the outcry, he asked, What's this noisy commotion? So the man rushed and came and told Eli. Now Eli was 98 years old and his eyes were fixed in a blind stare. Then the man said to Eli, I am one coming from the battlefield. I escaped from the battlefield today. What is happening, my son? He asked. And the messenger answered and said, Israel fled before the Philistines, and there has also been a great slaughter among the people. Also your two sons, Hophni and Pinchas, and the ark of Yahweh was captured. As soon as he mentioned the ark of Yahweh, Eli fell backward from his seat beside the town gate. Do you see that? His neck broke and he died, for he was old and heavy. He had judged Israel forty years. Now his daughter-in-law, Pinchas' wife, was with child and about to deliver. When she heard the report and the ark of Yahweh was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she crouched down and gave birth because she was seized with her labor pains. As she was dying, the woman attending to her said, Don't be afraid, for you have brought forth a son. But she did not respond or take it to heart. She named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel because of the capture of the ark of Yahweh and because of her father-in-law and her husband. So she said, The glory has departed from Israel for the ark of Yahweh has been taken. Brothers and sisters, the duty of the end time remnant is simple. It's the same message to the generations by men and women of righteousness who have gone before. Return to Yahweh your Elohim and be saved. Remove the idols from your midst and serve the true Elohim so that the presence of Yahweh may return to you and so that you may go in and inherit the land. You see, in order to understand the entire message, we need to fill in the gaps. And brethren, throughout time, the problem has been the same. Wicked leaders who teach the people for selfish gain. They stop speaking about holiness and righteousness. And because of it, Yahweh departs from them and their congregations. Yet when we take a closer look, we begin to see that they think that Yahweh's presence is still with them. It's a sad state of affairs. Brothers and sisters, when we take a closer look at the full story of Eli, we see a very clear prophecy that the wicked line of Eli and his sons would no longer be allowed to serve before him. That Yahweh would discard them and raise up a new priesthood, one that would stand before him forever until Yeshua returned. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 27, as well as 29, 31 to 33 and 35, it says the following. Behold the days of coming when I will break your strength and the strength of your father's house so that there will be not an old man in your house. And you will see the distress of my dwelling in spite of all that I do good for Israel. And an old man will not be in your house forever. Yet I will not cut off every man of yours from my altar, that your eyes may fail from weeping, and your soul grieve, and all the increase of your house will die in the prime of life. But I will raise up for myself a faithful priest, 
who will do according to what is in my heart and in my soul. And I will build him an enduring house and he will walk before my anointed always. You see, brothers and sisters, the problem is that you and I tend to, as human beings, look at everything one dimensionally and we tend to miss the real message. You see, right here through the prophet, he is announcing and pronouncing a curse on one priesthood and showing us that he will raise up a faithful priest, a priest who will be holy and will stand before Yahweh. And I believe that this priesthood, brothers and sisters, this is the priesthood of Yeshua. We need to see the type and foreshadows in Yahweh's word. You see, the priesthood of Eli is the same wicked priesthood that is spoken about in the book of Ezekiel. And it represents every wicked leader that does not teach holiness and righteousness, that does not teach people the correct way in walking in Yahweh's covenant. Every wicked leader that defiles the holiness of Yahweh for their own gain is represented by this priesthood. We need to remember that the sons of Eli were eating the choice meat of the sacrifice. They were not cared about Yahweh's holiness. They were not cared about the right way of doing things. You see, brothers and sisters, the problem with Eli is the same problem with the people of Yahweh today. They see the sin, yet they are refusing to rebuke it and get it out of the camp. Yet continually they turn around and say things like, let's not judge. Brothers and sisters, it's because no one is standing up that Yahweh chooses to judge that house forever. And boom, it happens. And we saw this happening. Yahweh judged that house forever. And boom, the glory of Yahweh departed. And Eli's sons died as the prophecy foretold. You see, what needs to be understood is that the prophet spoke of a new priesthood, a faithful priesthood, a priesthood that would walk in his righteousness and in the righteousness of Yahweh. A priesthood who would stand and guard the gates as well as sit at the table of Yahweh. Look at what it says in 1 Samuel 2.35. But I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who would do according to what is in my heart and in my soul. And I will build him an enduring house and he will walk before my anointed always. Brothers and sisters, this priesthood that he's spoken about is the priesthood of Zadok. And we know from the book of Chronicles that Zadok and his entire family remained faithful to David and they rejected Saul. Saul who was trying to kill David and he killed all the priests. Do you remember that? Now in Ezekiel chapter 44, and we have spoken about this passage of scripture many, many times, but we begin to see how Ezekiel 44 comes together. We see what happens when gatekeepers don't do their duty and instead allow the gates to swing wide open. And we begin to be able to put the prophetic picture together. Let's take a look at what it says in Ezekiel chapter 44, 1 to 15. It says, And he brought me back to the outer gate of the set-apart place, which faces east, and it was shut. And Yahweh said to me, This gate is shut. It is not open, and no one enters it, because Yahweh Elohim of Israel has entered by it, and it shall be shut. The prince as prince, he sits in it to eat bread before Yahweh, coming in by way of the porch of the gate, and going out the same way. And he brought me by way of the north gate to the front of the house. And I looked and saw the esteem of Yahweh filled the house of Yahweh, and I fell on my face. And Yahweh said to me, Son of man, set your heart and see with your eyes and hear with your ears all that I say to you concerning all the laws of the house of Yahweh and all its Torah. And you shall set your heart to the entrance of the house with all the exits of my set-apart place and shall say to the rebellious, to the house of Israel, this said the master Yahweh, O house of Israel, enough of all these abominations of yours that you brought in sons of a foreigner, uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh, to be in my set-apart place, to profane it, my house, that you brought near my food, the fat and the blood, and you broke my covenant because of all your abominations, and you did not guard the charge of that which is set apart to me, but you have set others to guard the charge of my set-apart place for you, people that we decide to be there. Not people that Yahweh places there. This said the master Yahweh, no son of a foreigner, uncircumcised in heart or uncircumcised in flesh, comes into my set-apart place, even any son of a foreigner who is among the children of Israel. And the Levites who went far from me when Israel went astray, who strayed away from me after their idols, they shall bear their crookedness. And they were attendants in my set-apart place. 
as gatekeepers of the house and attendants of the house, slaughtering the burnt offering and the offerings for the people and standing before them to attend to them because they attended to them before their idols and became a stumbling block of crookedness to the house of Israel. Therefore, I have lifted my hand in an oath against them, declares the master Yahweh, that they shall bear their crookedness. Then it continues in verse 13. And not come near me to serve as my priests, nor come near any of that which is set apart to me, nor into the most set apart place. Do you see that? They do not have a place in Yahweh's set apart place. And they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they have done. Yet I shall make them those who guard the duty of the house for all its work and for all that has to be done in it. But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, who guarded the duty of my set-apart place, when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall draw near to me to serve me and shall stand before me to bring to me the fat and the blood, declares the Master Yahweh. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but I don't want to be serving in the outer court. I want to be serving before His presence. I don't want to be out there because of my wickedness. This reminds me of a passage of scripture that says that those who do my commandments and teach others shall be called the greatest in the kingdom. But those who do not do them and do not teach them shall be called the least. We need to understand that in Yahweh's kingdom there is the greatest and the least. And there will be those that will be in the outer courts because they did not mature, because they did not clean out the defilement in their hearts. Now we've spoken many times about Ezekiel chapter 44 and I believe that it is a very important passage of scripture for our generation. We are alive, I believe, in the raising up of Yahweh's righteous priesthood, the sons and daughters of righteousness, who just like Job, Samuel, Deborah and Zadok and his sons, they desire to see the restoration of the house of David, the restoration of the presence of Yahweh among us in a united house. You see, without this restoration, we will be standing against the enemy as individuals and not as a unit. Only with the presence of the king, as in the days of David, will we truly overcome. Like I said, a united house. Now Ezekiel chapter 44 is a passage that is showing us the difference between the righteous and those who think they are righteous. Yet they have not remained faithful to Yeshua and done all that he requires of them. We have to come to see, brothers and sisters, that the name Zadok comes from the Hebrew word Sadiq, which means to be righteous. Zadok and his sons are righteous, and they are wanting to keep Yahweh's righteousness in order, if I have to put it that way. Also, Ezekiel 44 records the fact that the people were committing abominations in the house of Yahweh. And because of it, his presence had departed. When Yahweh's house falls into iniquity, the manifest presence cannot reside where sin is, and therefore it must depart into the wilderness, outside the camp. It actually literally becomes a voice crying out in the wilderness. And this becomes the work of those with the anointing and the mantle of Elijah. They become the witnesses to speak for the voice in the wilderness, for all Israel to return to the covenant, so that Yahweh can return to the camp from the wilderness and dwell amongst his people. Take note of the word wilderness. Now, brothers and sisters, we read a very important passage of Scripture in 2 Samuel that has such a prophetic significance for us today. And we need to understand what Zadok and his sons did and why they are such an important picture for this generation. Let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 14 to 30. Then David said to all his officials who were with him in Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, or else none of us will escape from Absalom. Leave in haste or else he will overtake us quickly and bring disaster down on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. Then the king's officials said to the king, Behold, your servants are ready to do whatever our master the king chooses. So the king set out and his entire household followed him. But the king left behind ten concubines to take care of the palace. And the king went out and all the people after him. They paused at the last house. All his servants passed on beside him. All the uh, Sherethites and the Pelethites and the Gittites, 600 men that had come after him from Gath, passed on before the king. Then the king said to Ittai the Gittite, Why should you also go with us? Go back and stay with the king, for you are a foreigner and also an exile from your own place. 
Your arrival was only yesterday. Should I make you wander around with us today to go wherever I may go? Go back and take your kinsmen back with you. Kindness and truth be with you. Now take note of what happens in verse 21. But Ittai answered the king and said, As Yahweh lives and as my master the king lives, surely in whatever place my master the king will be, whether for death or for life, there also will your servant be. So David said to Ittai, Go on and cross over. So Ittai the Gittai passed on with all his men and all the little children who were with him, while all the country was weeping with a loud voice. All the people were crossing over, as the king was crossing over Kidron Valley. So all the people crossed over towards the road of the wilderness. Take note of that. Then behold, Zadok also came, and all the Levites with him, carrying the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh. They set down the Ark of Elohim. Then Abithar came up until all the people had passed by out of the city. But the king said to Zadok, Return the Ark of Yahweh to the city. If I find favor in Yahweh's eyes, he will bring me back. And let me see it and his dwelling. But if he says this, I have no delight in you, here I am. Let him do to me as seems good in his eyes. The king also said to Zadok the priest, Do you not see? Return to the city in Shalom with your two sons with you, Ahamaz your son and Jonathan son of Abithar. See, I will wait at the fords of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. Therefore Zadok and Abithar carried the ark of Yahweh back to Jerusalem and they remained there. Then David continued to go up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he ascended. And he had his head covered, and he was walking barefoot. So all the people with him each covered his head as they went up, weeping as they ascended. Now, brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but this passage of Scripture is so interwoven with prophetic significance for you and I. I pray that you are seeing the prophetic patterns there. They are absolutely amazing. Firstly, take note that David, remember we know that David is a type and foreshadow of Yeshua. So David, Yeshua, is going into exile. Why? Because Israel rejected him. He has 600 servants, remember, that pass him by. Remember, I want you to think of six millennial days since the rejection of the tree of life until our redemption comes. David type and foreshadow of Yeshua, he appoints 10 women, 10 concubines in the story. I want you to think of the 10 virgins from the Gospels. And he tells these 10 concubines to occupy and keep the house until his return. He tries to send a new follow, Ittai, back to the city since he is new to the group. And times are difficult. And Ittai says he is going wherever David is going in life and death. There is a great weeping and David Yeshua crosses over the Kidron in his way to the wilderness, the place where the voice is crying out in the wilderness, and they bear the Ark of the Testimony with them. They set down the Ark and Abathar goes up till everyone passes out of the city. You see, Abathar is a type of the Levites who ascends and draws close to Yahweh, serving as the priests until all have passed out of the city. Then David, Yeshua, he tells Zadok to carry the Ark of the Testimony to protect the very presence of Yahweh. He tells him to take the Testimony back to the city until he finds favor in Yahweh's eyes. And Yahweh brings David or Yeshua back again. He then asks Zadok if he's a seer. Does he have eyes to see? I pray, brothers and sisters, that you're seeing the connections. He's asking Zadok, do you have eyes to see? And this is the same question that relates to Elijah's commission as well as the seven assemblies in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Repeatedly they are asked, He who has eyes to see and ears to hear, they are blessed. So David, a type and foreshadow of Yeshua, is asking Zadok if he can see as a seer sees. Can he see as a seer sees? Does he have discernment? So David, again Yeshua, he sends Zadok and his two sons, who are what? A representation of the two witnesses, back to the city. Abathar had, had ascended as a priest, but later in his life, he is actually sent out from Solomon's presence, stating that he deserved death for supporting Solomon's adversary. And I believe that Solomon's adversary in this passage of scripture relates in this modern day and age to the harlot that rides the beast. You see, Solomon's adversary was attempting to usurp the throne. The sons of Zadok, who are really Zadok's son Ahimaaz, or Hahimaz, and Jonathan, the son of Abithar. They are called the sons of Zadok. Now notice the history of Abithar. 
In 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 11 to 24, it tells us the following. David summoned Zadok and Abithar the Kohenim, the priests, along with the Levites, Uriel, Asiah, Joel, Shemai, Elel, and Aminibad, Dab. <laughs> he told them, you are the heads of the Levitical family. Sanctify yourselves, you and your kinsmen, so that you may bring up the Ark of Yahweh. This is on the second attempt that David does it right. The Elohim of Israel, to, to the place that I prepared for it. Because you were not there the first time, Yahweh our Elohim burst out upon us, for we did not seek him regarding the prescribed way. So the Kohenim, the priests and the Levites, sanctified themselves in order to bring up the ark of Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel. Let's follow on. In 1 Samuel 22, 17 to 22, it says, Then the king ordered the guards attending him, Turn around and kill the Kohenim of Yahweh. For they are in cahoots with David. This is in the days of Saul where he killed all the priests. For they knew that he was running away but did not inform me. But the servants of the king were not willing to raise their hand to assault the Kohenim of Yahweh. So the king said to Doach, You turn around and kill the priest, the Kohenim. So Doach, the Edomite, turned and fell upon the Kohenim. And on that day killed 85 men who wore the linen ephod. Wow. Nob. The town of the Kohenim, he struck with the edge of the sword. Men and women, children and infants, oxen, asses and sheep with the edge of the sword. Yet one of the sons of Amalach, son of Ahitab, named Abithar, are you seeing where Abithar now comes from, escaped and fled to David. Abithar told David that Saul had slain Yahweh's priests. Then David said to Abithar, I knew on that day when Doach the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul. I have brought about the death of all the people of your father's house. Stay with me and fear not. For the one who is seeking my life is seeking your life too. But with me, you shall be safe. Let's take a look at what it says in Mark chapter 2 in verse 24. The Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not permitted on Shabbat? And he said to them, Haven't you ever read what David did when he was in need? And he and those who were with him became hungry. How he entered into the house of Yahweh when Abithar was Kohen Hachadol and ate the showbread, which is permitted only for the Kohenim to eat, and gave some even to those who were with him. We read further about Abithar in 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 26. Onwards it says, Also to Abithar the Kohen the king said, Go to Anoth, to your own fields, for you deserve death. But I will not put you to death at this time, because you carried the ark of Yahweh Elohim before my father David, and because you were afflicted in everything which my father was afflicted. So Solomon dismissed Abithar from being Cohen to Yahweh. So fulfilling the word of Elohim that spoke at Shiloh about the house of Eli that we just read about previously. I hope you're beginning to put these pieces together. I know it's a lot of information, but I pray that you will put the pieces together so that you can fully understand what's going on. Like I said, notice this last expulsion of Abithar is to complete the prophecy that Yahweh said Eli's line would not continue in the high priest's office because he did not separate the holy from the profane. In fact, Solomon was doing this final act because Abithar was involved in a league that opposed Solomon verse Adon um, Adoniah. And, and I believe that this, this guy, Adonia, that he is a type and foreshadow of the harlot that rides the beast in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 3. You see, Zadok and Abithar are the ones who went up in the story of David when David goes into exile, when they set down the ark of the testimony. And Abithar is a priest who escaped Saul's killing of all the priests of Yahweh when they helped David escape from Saul. Zadok and Abithar then returned to the city with the Ark of the Testimony, the very presence of Yahweh, as David commanded. And they returned with the remnant of their seed called the sons of Zadok. Amiaz is Zadok's son and Jonathan is Abithar's son. You see, brothers and sisters, David, who is prophetic of Yeshua, calls both of these sons, the son of Ahimaz as well as the son of Jonathan, he calls them the sons of Zadok. And they return to the city and they wait to certify David's or Yeshua's return. Are you beginning to see the prophetic pictures? How the sons of Zadok or the final remnant is a forerunner, protecting the presence of Yahweh until Yeshua returns, just as in the story here of the sons of Zadok. Brothers and sisters, the sons of Zadok, those Levites that were faithful to David, when he thought unable to rule the kingdom, 
They are the ones, as it says in Ezekiel 44, that will be allowed to minister unto Yahweh as priests, and they will be allowed to enter the most holy place and stand before him and offer the sacrifice. The Levites will be allowed in the sanctuary, but not in the most holy place. Now, my aim is to put this all together with Revelation. The question is, where is the most holy place in the book of Revelation? We need to check. Is it on earth? Is it in heaven? Is everyone there? Or are only some there and some are not? Brothers and sisters, let's not oversimplify because we don't understand the full revelation of the scriptures. Let's simply hear what Yahweh is saying and attempt to understand. In 1 Kings chapter 1 and verse 6 onwards, we read the following. His father had not scolded him at any time by asking, Why have you behaved this way? He was also a very handsome man, and he was born after Absalom. So he conferred with Joab, son of Zeruah, and with Abithar the Kohen. Following Adonijah, they supported him. But Zadok the Kohen, Benai, the son of Jehodiah, Nathan the prophet, Shemai, Re, and David's mighty men were not on Adonijah's side. Do you see that? Zadok the Kohen Nathan and others stood away from this, how do I say, this revolt that was happening because of Adoniah. Now it appeared that Abithar, that Abithar, after fleeing Saul's slaughter of the priests of Yahweh, then gets involved in a league that opposes the rightful heir Solomon. And all the people support Adoniah just as Solomon is about to be made king. And Abithar supports Adoniah as well. My question then is, is this not a prophetic picture of the covenant with death that we read about in the book of Revelation? Zadok stays with Solomon and later is appointed in the room of Abithar. In other words, in the office of a priest. He is appointed in the room of Abithar as high priest. So Zadok and Abithar both become high priests. Could this be an allusion to what happens to the Levites for not protecting the sanctuary? They are originally aligned with Yahweh and then mistakenly begin to support the anti-Messiah. That's what is happening today. We have many people that are, that, are, that are falling to apostasy because they have not aligned themselves with Yahweh. So by becoming priests with David, who is a type and foreshadow of Yeshua, they escape death. Then later they forsake Yeshua. You see, brothers and sisters, they used to carry the Ark of the Testament and kept the holy from the profane. But later they go astray, as do the people of Israel from Yahweh's covenant, his Torah, and are worthy of death for doing so. But out of mercy they are allowed to live, and are sent to serve further from the Messiah. And it's only Zadok and his sons that are given the room or the position of high priest in the most holy place. Whereas Abithar and, and his descendants are not allowed in that place. 1 Kings chapter 2 in verse 35 tells us the following. Then the king appointed Benai, son of Jehodiah, in his place over the army. And Zadok the Kohen, the king appointed in Abathar's place. Do you see that? He removes Abathar. He's no longer allowed to stand there. And Zadok becomes the Kohen. Brothers and sisters, I pray that you're seeing the prophetic pattern. Abathar escapes the killing of all the priests of Yahweh when Saul came to try and kill all the priests in the city of Nob. And he flees and goes to David and shows him that all the priests of Yahweh have been slain. David, who is a type and foreshadow of Yeshua, then asks Abithar to remain with him in order to be safeguarded and to protect the very presence of Yahweh. Brothers and sisters, are you seeing the hints of the two witnesses and their resurrection and calling up to heaven? You see, after crossing the Kidron, David ascends the Mount of Olives until he receives favor from Yahweh. He goes into exile and he goes up the Mount of Olives. Do you remember? His head is covered and his feet are bare. And he receives favor. He can only return when he receives favor from Yahweh. That's exactly what it tells us in Acts chapter 3 and verse 21. That times of refreshing will come when the master Yahweh sends Yeshua back to earth. And he, he only... Pardon me. He's on the Mount of Olives and he re he, until he receives favor from Yahweh and can return to the city and the ten women who are keeping the house. Remember the ten concubines? They are David's concubines or virgins. They represent those that have the right oil. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 25, 1 to 12. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. 
For when the foolish ones took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise ones took oil in jars along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was taking a long time, they all got drowsy and started falling asleep. But in the middle of the night there was a shout, Look, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins got up and trimmed their lamps. Now the foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, since your lamps are going out. But the wise ones replied, No, there won't be enough for us and for you. Instead, go to those who sell and buy some for yourselves. But while they were going off to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with them to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Now later, the other virgins came, saying, Sir, sir, open for us. But he replied, Amen, I tell you, I do not know you. You see, brothers and sisters, these ten virgins or concubines are likened to those who have not defiled themselves with another spirit. The other spirit is the harlot that rides the beast. You see, they have the Torah, but only five of them have the Messiah Yeshua, the true light, the Shemash, the light of the world. You see, to be considered wise and full of oil by Yahweh, you cannot have one and not the other. So both David and Yeshua then instruct these ten virgins or concubines, as we saw in the story, to do something very specific. Just as the ten virgins are instructed to do something, so the ten concubines in the story of David, which is a prophetic picture, they are told to occupy while he tarries until he returns. Look at what it says in Luke chapter 19. Pardon me, Luke chapter 19 verse 12 says the following. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive, a, to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. We have been called to occupy Yahweh's kingdom until he returns, to remain faithful unto him, just as the ten virgins need to not to be defiled with the spirit of this world, to guard the gates of his kingdom and the gates of our own hearts. Brothers and sisters, I hope that you are beginning to see that the final remnant has a duty to protect the presence of Yahweh. Just as Zadok and Abithar were called upon by David to protect the ark, so you and I have been called to protect Yahweh's presence until Yeshua returns. Just as David went into exile, so we wait for Yeshua to return. And Abba is looking for his faithful to protect and guard his presence so that the world might know that he's the one true to him. You know, brothers and sisters, Yahweh wants us to conform to the character of His Son. He wants us to be sadiqs. And Hebrew th thought with regard to sonship, you know, it means so much more than just part of the family. It means in the character of, in the very essence and character of. And what we see by all of this is that the Zadokite priests were in the character of Zadok. As we have seen from the passages before, Zadok remained faithful to David, who is a type and foreshadow of Yeshua, in a time of great trial. Think of the great tribulation and those that will remain faithful to him. And we read and we saw in all the other teachings, the congregation of Philadelphia is the congregation of the faithful and they are given the key of David. The key to the very kingdom to go and do the works of Yeshua. And they are called pillars and i told you so many times before pillars was the word that was used before we had priests to be a pillar in the temple of yahweh means that you're a priest one who serves him brothers and sisters yahweh is looking for men and women who will conform to his image to the image of his son who is the righteous king and who will exhibit his character in a dying generation. Men and women who are willing to stand as gatekeepers and priests, first of their own lives and then of the communities and nations. The question is, will you take a stand? To the Zadokites, it was given to stand in the presence of the king and to teach the people the difference between the holy and the profane. Today, Yahweh is wanting such people, people who are not interested in their own self-righteousness, but in the righteousness of Yahweh. People who will remain faithful unto Him. You know, the Zadokites remained faithful for generations, even for centuries, all the way to the time of the Maccabees where there were still Zadokites. All the way through the Hasmonean period. And finally, only then, did they become corrupt. Brothers and sisters, I hope that you are beginning to see that throughout time, Yahweh has faithful servants, people that have guarded His presence and the gates so that His presence might remain among his people 
So the question then is, who are the gatekeepers today? And we have come to see that each one of us has to act as a priest with regards to our own life. We have to walk in holiness and integrity and we need to make sure that we guard our gates and make sure that we only allow that which is permitted in or out of our lives. But what about the body of Messiah Yeshua today? Who are to be gatekeepers today who stand in, as, as gatekeepers as the last line of defense within the congregation? Let's take a look at what John chapter 10 and verse 1 to 3 says. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the sheep, shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. And you know, we have traditionally misunderstood this passage of scripture. Traditionally, we've been taught that the gatekeeper is to be the father, Yahweh. However, the Greek word used in John chapter 10 is thyros. And it actually means doorkeeper, a servant who attends to what comes in and out of a particular door to the kingdom. It is also the same word used by Yeshua that he uses in Mark chapter 13, 34 for servants in which authority is given to the doorkeeper. The servants that he leaves in charge, those 10 concubines, for example, that he leaves in charge. The faithful. You see, brothers and sisters, those who embrace the life of maturity, <coughs> pardon me, and walking in servitude and covenant, as well as holiness, those kind of people become priests. They become doorkeepers, gatekeepers to the house of the Father, the abode of the kingdom of Yahweh, the house of Yahweh. And it says in Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. So then the question is, what exactly are these openings that are to be guarded so closely? In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19, as well as Matthew chapter 18, verse 18 to 19, it says the following, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Binding and loosing is a Hebraic idiom for allowing and disallowing. If you haven't listened to our teaching on binding and loosing, I urge you to do so. You'll find it on the YouTube channel, where we explain what binding and loosing means, to allow or disallow. You can only allow or disallow something if the word of Yahweh lives within your heart. Then you will ask according to His will, and it shall be given unto you. So it says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. Brothers and sisters, when Yeshua says in Matthew 16, 19, that he has given to his disciples within the family of Israel, not the keys to, but the keys of the kingdom, thereby authorizing them and every faithful servant to become gatekeepers to his kingdom, which is the house of Yahweh, the holy temple, the abode of his father. He's speaking from the Hebraic perspective of Isaiah chapter 22 that we just read, concerning his authority to disperse his key among the faithful, among those doing his will. You see, we have seen how with Yeshua's resurrection from the dead, that temple has now passed from without to within, into the lives of those who receive his Ruach HaKodesh and walk in his ways. Brothers and sisters, the kingdom of Yahweh is now among those inhabiting the kingdom. The keeper of the keys has the power to open and to shut whatever passes through the gates of the kingdom. And in Matthew chapter 18 verse 18, Yeshua reiterates about how those keys are to be implemented. And the context of that passage is concerning behavior, how we walk with him. Matthew 18 verse 18, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be, shall, shall be having been bound in heaven, and whatever you loosen on earth shall be having loosened in heaven. Like I said, the Hebraic understanding of binding and loosing is better translated as allow and disallow. Those that mature to become the sons and daughters of Yahweh, I believe will be used by Yahweh to stand in His presence 
and thereby to reveal him to the nations. Just as Moshe went up to the mountain and received the commandments and came down and the glory of Yahweh was upon his face and all Israel was in, 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 in awe of what they saw and in fear, so too those who are spending time in Yahweh's presence will have his presence upon them and they will reveal it to the nations. I believe that they will form part of the congregation of Philadelphia who have the key of David which speaks as I told you of Isaiah chapter 22 as they have the open door to do the greater works of Yeshua and they are also called as I said pillars which was the word used for a priest in ancient times. This is a picture of his faithful few those people who are willing to count the cost to restore that which is lost. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7, we read the following. To the messenger of the Kahal, to the assembly in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is set apart and true, who holds the key of David, which he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. And like I said, which quotes Yeshayahu, Isaiah 22, that I will clothe him with your robe and fasten your sash around him and hand your authority over to him. He will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem and to the house of Yehuda. And I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. You see, brothers and sisters, to Peter was given the keys of the kingdom to be able to do the works of his father. Peter was to be a messenger of reconciliation, a priest of righteousness who stood as a gatekeeper to his father's kingdom. Him and all the other disciples that matured had to have this role. And we see this taking place in Acts chapter 15 as the role of the judges passed unto the apostles in the New Testament. Only once Peter walked by the Ruach of Yahweh was he able to see the truth. He had to have a life-changing experience. It was once his eyes of his spirit man were opened that he understood that Yeshua was the Messiah. It was then that Yeshua told him that he was a true son of inheritance. He was now ready to have the authority of that son placed on him. If we remain children, we will not be able to walk in this authority. Only when we have Yahweh's Torah in our hearts and in our lives, and we walk according to His ways, and we have His word written upon our hearts, then we can ask according to His word, and it shall be done. And then we will be able to teach others the way of righteousness, as recorded in Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 22, 23, pardon me, that, that relates to the righteous. And they are to teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane. The set apart and the profane. And make them know what is clean and unclean. And they are to stand as judges. Do you see that? They are to stand as gatekeepers in a dispute. And judge it according to my right rulings. And they are to guard my Torah and my laws. And all my appointed festivals and my set apart Sabbaths. Brothers and sisters, each one of us needs to choose if we will remain a believer or grow into a disciple of righteousness, one who is willing to count the cost to restore the presence of Yahweh, both in our communities and ultimately our nations. We need to stand as gatekeepers in our own lives and get rid of all that hinders us before we can take care of the sins in the camp. Yahweh is looking for a son and daughter who, like Zadok, will remain faithful to him until the end. Brothers and sisters, I end off this teaching with Psalm 24, which if truly understood explains what will happen when each one of us takes our responsibility for our own gates. And then when we come together because of our walking in righteousness and holiness, I believe the glory of Yahweh will be among us and His presence will be felt. Let's take note of what it says in Psalm 24, verse 1 onwards. The earth belongs to Yahweh and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it, for he has founded it upon the seas, and upon the waters he does establish it. Who does go up to the mountain of Yahweh, and who does stand in his set-apart place? He who has innocent hands and a clean heart, who did not bring his life to naught, and did not swear deceivingly. He receives a blessing from Yahweh, and righteousness from the Elohim of his deliverance. This is the generation of those who seek him. Jacob, who seek your face. Lift up your heads, O you gates. And be lifted up your everlasting doors. And let the sovereign of esteem come in. Who is the sovereign of esteem? Yahweh, strong and mighty. Yahweh, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Even lift up your everlasting doors. And let the sovereign of esteem come in. Who is the sovereign of esteem? Yahweh of hosts. He is the sovereign of esteem. You know, the first part of the psalm details for us who may ascend the hill of Yahweh. 
or what type of person can stand before him. And verse 4 tells us, in the King James translates it a little bit better, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust an idol, who does not believe in a false god, who does not put other things in their heart above Yahweh, nor swear by a false god. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not put their trust in an idol. And verse 5 says, he receives a blessing from Yahweh and righteousness from the Elohim of his deliverance. Just like Pinchas had an everlasting covenant, so these people receive the righteousness from Elohim. And Yahweh says, this is the kind of generation that I am looking for. A generation that seeks him, that seeks his face. But you know, verse 7 to 10 is the most important. Take note that gates do not have heads. We know that. So could it be that on a deeper level, that what needs to be understood is that when we live our lives in this manner, with clean hands and a pure heart, when we seek Yahweh with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our souls, we in essence then become the gates through which His glory shines. Our lives become that gate. You see, if you remember in previous teachings, I explained that Yahweh revealed Himself then in ancient times. He revealed Himself in Israel in the hope of finally revealing Himself through them. He revealed Himself to, in, and finally through, so that they would become a true kingdom of priests. And this is still His heart today. His desire for a man or woman, His, to, his desire is for a person to take this stand, and to live a holy set-apart life unto Him, that He might reveal His glory to them first, then in them, and finally through them, so that their lives might be a gate for others. Brothers and sisters, I pray that this teaching has blessed you, and that you have come to see the true importance of living a set-apart life and maturing in Yeshua. We have been called to be gatekeepers, to protect the very presence of Yahweh in our lives and in the lives of others by standing up for unrighteousness, by not just turning our faces and looking the other way, but by saying, hey, you know what? This needs to get out of the camp so that Yahweh's presence might dwell among us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today in the wonderful and powerful name of Yeshua. Father, that you are doing a great new thing upon this earth. And Father, I want to pray for every person that has joined us. I pray, Father, that they will grow, that they will mature. Father, that they will understand that it is imperative that we live our lives in you, that we walk in holiness, that our hands are pure, that our hearts are pure, that our hands are clean. And Father, so that we may become people that reveal you to the world. As we live like that, Father, I believe that we will see a great, great awakening upon this earth. Father, I pray a blessing upon your people today. I pray that you will bless them and keep them, that you will make your face to shine upon them, and that you will give them peace in the days to come. We honor you and we thank you. In Yeshua Mashiach's name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I thank you for joining me. I pray that Yahweh will bless you and keep you. I invite you to subscribe to this channel by clicking the subscribe button at the bottom. I also invite you to head over to www treasuredinheritanceministry.com Become a member where you can download these notes for this teaching and study it out for yourself. We thank you for your support and your prayers and we pray Yahweh's richest blessing upon you and your family in the days to come.